Hey guys, Frosty Knives here, back with another book review. And today we are going to be uh, taking a look at the second book in the Gwendy trilogy, this time written by Richard Chismar. And we are going to be talking about Gwendy's Magic Feather. Uh, now this book was published in 2019. Uh, it clocks in at 210 pages and it is the middle book and the uh, well-received Gwendy trilogy. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, so it's been uh, quite a few years since we last met 12-year-old Gwendy Peterson and her infamous button box. Uh, so since that time, uh, Gwendy has graduated high school and college. She has had a successful career as an advertising executive. Uh, she's uh, sold uh, multiple best-selling novels, so she's an author. She's also a very well-accomplished documentary maker. Uh, she wrote a book and a documentary about her best friend who died from AIDS. She won an Academy Award for that documentary, so she's also an Academy Award winner. And then finally, she has become a congresswoman. And that's where we meet her at the beginning of the book, 37-year-old Gwendy Peterson as a congresswoman in Washington, D.C. And then uh, one day, just out of the blue, the button box appears in her office again. She doesn't know why. She doesn't know who sent it. She has no idea where it, where it came from. Uh, there's no note. She doesn't know what she's supposed to do with it. It is, it is just there. So she falls back onto what uh, she did with it as a child, and she decides to safeguard it again. Um, and at, at this time, this is right before her big government Christmas break. Uh, so then she goes home for Christmas, uh, back to Castle Rock. She takes the box with her. Uh, she goes back home to celebrate Christmas um, with her mom and dad. And of course, as we know, there are things going on in in the rock because this is Castle Rock and Castle Rock just can't have uh, a time where nothing uh, suspicious ever happens in Castle Rock. So because it is Castle Rock and we need the Castle Rock story, there are some things going on with it. Uh, and when she gets back home, um, she uh, her mom is is battling cancer um, and she just came out of some successful, uh, treatment of her cancer. Uh, so she has to deal with that. And also, uh, Sheriff Norris Ridgewick, who's a sheriff now, is dealing with the disappearance of not one, not two, but eventually three, uh, missing children in the rock. So we have something, again, going afoot. In Castle Rock, as always, because it's Castle Rock. And so Gwendy has to deal with those things um, while she's there, plus the button box coming back into her life, and what is she supposed to do with it? And because uh, the box has come back into her life, uh, she started having dreams again, she started having nightmares again, she started jumping at shadows, uh, she thinks that uh, there may be someone uh, watching her, uh, she th sees shadow-like figures in her closet, in her outside of her window, uh, and she doesn't know what to make of it, so she has to wrestle with all of that uh, over the Christmas break. And that's where I'm going to leave the story, because I'm not going to tell you how it's resolved, um, but that's the gist of the 210-page story. So, let's talk about what I liked about it, and what I not so much liked about it. So I've never read, read a Richard Chismar book before. Um, I will say that the writing in here was, was pretty crisp. Uh, it was well done. Um, one of the things that Richard Chismar likes to do, I don't know if he does this in all of his books, but he does it in this one, is he writes very short chapters. There are 72 chapters in this 210-page book. And he writes very short chapters. Some of his chapters are, most of his chapters are one or two pages long. Some of his chapters are a paragraph long. And very occasionally, he has longer chapters, uh, four or five, maybe six-page chapters, where something is happening and he needs more time to talk about it. So his chapters are very short. And that's not a criticism. I think that's an interesting way to write a book. 
And um, I sort of like that idea because it, 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 it encourages you to keep right reading, right? Because the chapters are so short, you can go, I'll read one more, I'll read one more. It doesn't feel like a heavy lift. And so it, it encourages you to keep reading and that sort of sets the pacing for the book. This book could conceivably be read in a day. I took a couple of days to read it, but you could read it in a day. You could read it in a sitting. Um, you could. Um, it's not a heavy lift. Um, and I like the fact that he structured uh, his chapters that way um, because it didn't feel like um, you were going into something. It, it felt easy to read and it encouraged you to read and encouraged you to kept, keep going. So I thought that was good and thought that was interesting. It's nice to be back in Castle Rock. Castle Rock post needful things because this takes place at at uh in the at the turn of the century uh y2k um so it's nice to see the rock uh after leland gaunt tried to blow it up and destroy it in needful things um it was nice to see the rock again it was nice to see uh all the people and and new people and old people in the rock. It's almost as if Richard Chismar has taken it, taken us on a tour of the Castle Rock, of Castle Rock, a who's who and what's what uh, in the rock. Because he makes mention of a lot of things. We talk about uh, he 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 touches on all the major events that happened in the rock. Touches on Dead Zone. Touches on Cujo. Touches on Needful Things. Uh, he talks about all the major who's who of the Cal of Castle Rock. We we talk about he, he mentions Sheriff Bannerman, Sh Alan Pangborn, Norris Ridgewick is the sheriff. Pop Merrill is mentioned, so it, it's nice to be back in in the Rock and to see what happened and how they rebuilt after what they call the Big Fire of ninety one. The Big Fire. That's pretty. That's pretty accurate. They did. They tried to blow up and burn the burn the town down, and they did a pretty good job of it in needful things. So it was nice. It was nice to see that. Um, uh, I, I did enjoy it. Um, so those are some of the things that I liked about the book. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that I may or may not liked about the book. Uh, I will say going into this that I found this book to be a very middle of the road book. I think I, ra I rated it a three on Goodreads because I gave it a sort of middle-of-the-road average rating for what I felt was a middle-of-the-road average book. Um, and it, and, and it, it is the middle book in a trilogy. Um, so what are some of the things that, I, that didn't quite resonate uh, with me? Um, well, one of the things was I, I wasn't really sure of the purpose of the book. Um, I'm not sure what type of story that the book was trying to tell us. If the book was trying to tell us the middle story of Gwendy's life, the first book is she's 12 years old, and she gets the button box for the first time, so that's the first chapter of her life. Then now she's 37 in the Congress moment, and this is the second chapter of her life. And then the la next book, Gwendy's Final Task, is sort of the end chapter of her life. So if this book is telling us the middle story of Gwendy's life, and then it, it succeeded. Um, but other than that, I'm not really sure what sort of story it was trying to tell. Um, because we never really got sufficient explanations, in my opinion, about why things were happening. We did get explanations, but I don't feel that they were sufficient. We did get an explanation of why she has the button box. Um, it was actually in the very last, second to last chapter. Everything was sort of explained in the second to last chapter. We did get an explanation of it, and I read it, and it felt paper thin to me. I didn't; it didn't quite resonate with me. It didn't; it didn't explain anything really. There was an explanation, but it didn't explain what I wanted it to explain. So I thought the explanation fell flat um, of why this was happening to her. Uh, let's talk about the magic feather. It is called Gwendy's magic feather. So where's the magic feather? Well, the magic feather shows up twice, three times. Magic feather doesn't show up until three quarters of the way in the book, until Christmas, when she's opening presents and her father gives her a present and she opens it up and it's a card 
And inside the card is this feather. And she says, oh my God, I haven't seen this feather since I was a child. And he's like, aha, I found it in my workshop and I knew you would want it. And so here's, here's the present, it's the feather. And you find out that this is a feather that she got when she was a child from another child who tried to tell her it was a magic feather and sold it to her for $9. And then she kept it. And then she lost it. And then her father found it again and gave it to her as a present. It's never really explained what, what this feather is and why she thinks it's magic. The only thing that happens with the feather is that she gives it to her mother when her mother goes into the hospital for cancer treatment. And then she comes out and she's fine. And she says, I guess your feather was magic after all. And that's it. I think Chismar was trying to use the feather as a metaphor for the button box. The button box is the true source of magic. And he's he's using this as a metaphor, whereas in the in when she was a kid, she thought this was magic. It was just a feather, and she believed it was magic. But the button box is actual magic. And I think he was trying to use that as a metaphor, but it didn't work for me. It, it really didn't work for me, and I didn't understand why the magic feather was even included. What, it wasn't it wasn't sufficiently explained that he might have been using it as a metaphor. He didn't connect the idea of uh, a magic item that she thought was magic as a child to an actual magic item that she actually has um, sufficiently enough to where you, you make that, that logical connection. Um, so that didn't seem to work for me either. Um, now let's talk about characterization. Now this book has been out for a long time. I did a review for the button box way back when, when it first came out. I first read it. And back then, I didn't, in that review, I didn't tell you who gave her the button box. Well, this book has been out for a while. A lot of people, if you've read it, you've read it. And if you know, you know. Um, so we are going to talk about who gave her the button box. Um, but if you don't want to know, still don't want to know who gave her the button box, just know that we are going to talk about spoilers in three, two, one, okay, now we're going to talk about who gave her the button box. Now, in the, in the first book, she was given the button box by a man in black named Richard Ferris. Now, any constant reader knows it doesn't matter if your name is Richard Ferris, Russell Faraday, Richard Fannin, Walter... This is Randall Flagg. Randall Flagg gave her the button box. He gave her the button box in the first book. He gives her the button box again in this book. And I just didn't feel that the characterization of Randall Flagg in this book fit. And I'll tell you why. In the first book, he gives her the button box. Now, Randall Flagg is an agent of chaos. Always has been. So he goes and he gives a 12-year-old girl a powerful object, an object that has the ability to destroy the universe, to destroy everything. He gives her that kind of power and he puts that kind of power in the hands of a 12 year old because he wants to see what she's going to do with it. He wants to see if she's going to be tempted by it. He wants to see if she's going to blow things up. He wants to see if she's going to foment chaos and she doesn't. So it was this, this test, this power test. What do you do when you get this, when you get an object of immense power and you, you're told not to touch it and then they leave? What do you do with it? So I understand why he did it in this book, in that book. In this book, I don't understand. Um, he tells her that he gave her the button box because he found himself in a pickle. We never find out, find out what that pickle is. And he needed some place to put the button box where it would be kept safe. And he gave it to Gwendy because he could trust her. And he knew she would do good with it. And so he gave her the button box and now he's come back to take it back and told her that she'd done good and she did good with it. The characterization of Richard Farris in this book feels downright noble, nice. He's nice to her. He thinks she's a good person. He likes her. He trusts her. 
And none of that resonates with me. If you're talking Randall Flagg, Randall Flagg trusts no one. Randall Flagg isn't good to anyone. He's not even good to Roland. Um, he does. He thinks he's being good to Roland, but of course he's he's just using Roland for his own means. So I just felt the characterization. If, if, if Richard Ferris is the man in black, is Randall Flagg, he's not a nice guy. And he's not a trusting guy. And he doesn't do things out of the goodness of his heart, yet that's what it felt like in this book. And that felt off really off to me and i don't understand why because king helped edit this book it, it just felt it didn't feel like flag that's all i can say about it to me it didn't resonate and it didn't feel like flag to me and the explanation that he gives of why he gave in the button box is so paper thin that that also fell flat for me um so i didn't i didn't quite buy into the character of Ferris in this book. Um, and the major the major theme that she's wrestling with in this book, in, in the first book she wrestles with, what do you do with when you're given a book of uh, something of immense power and how do you handle it? In this book, she's wrestling with how do I know that all the good things that happened in my life happened because of me, because I did those things, because I accomplished those things, or because the button box made those things happen for me. How do I know that I'm not just living a lie? And of course, Richard Farris tells her at the end, no, those things have nothing to do with the button box. They, they happen to you because you are a good person and because you mean well, and because you put good in the world and not because of the button box. This is all you um, and not, not what you think it is. Again, f nice explanation, felt out of character. So... Um, overall, I, again, I thought it was a solid three. It is a middle of the road book, uh, for middle of the road rating for a middle of the road book. I did like the writing. It is a quick read. Thought the writing was well done. I liked seeing Castle Rock, like seeing, uh, the old names and events of Castle Rock crop up again. I like seeing Gwendy again. I like the character of Gwendy. Um, so we'll see how she finishes up in the last book, but I like her character, so it's nice to see Gwendy again. But some of the things that happened in the book and some of the explanations that happened in the book and some of the characterizations that happened in the book just fell flat for me. And, and that's how I read it, and that's how I, I, I felt about reading that book. So uh, not that it's bad, um, but it's not really where I thought it would be. Um, so guys, there is a King-ish, King-ish, Stephen King-ish review of Richard Chismar's Gwendy's Magic Feather. So let's talk about it. Tell me what you think, thought about it. Tell me, did you read the book? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Why did you like it and why didn't you like it? What did you like about it and what didn't you like about it? Let's talk about that uh, and, and, and get some conversation going. And as always... Thanks for watching. Uh, give it a like. Give it a thumbs up. Give it a share. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell those weird, mysterious people in black hats that give you weird, mysterious objects of power in your life. Now, until next time, I'll see you in the next video.